Good morning. We are about six weeks away from the new year, from Rosh Hashanah. And uh, a little less than 40 days away from the creation of the world, which was on the 25th of Elul. So as we come to the most suspicious days, the most uh, important days, days of influence on the whole year, I think it is important to speak about a topic that has to do directly with Rosh Hashanah, which is the soul. What does the soul have to do with Rosh Hashanah, you may ask? Well, the world was created on the 25th of the month of Elul. That was a Sunday. And on Friday was Rosh Hashanah, was the day of creation of man. And it all starts from man. The verse says in Tehilim, Achor v'kedem tzartani, God, you created me last and first. What does it mean that you have been created last and first? It means that you are the last creation of all the creation. God created everything, and the last thing he did on Friday before Shabbat was to create you and me, man. On the other hand, Man is the first of all creation. Why? Because everything was created for man. And therefore, man has an obligation to say, as it says in the Talmud of Rosh Hashanah, Chayav Adam Lomar Bishvili Nivra Olam. The world was created for me. And I don't mean these people that say, hey, the world was created for me, get out of my way. I'm not talking about bullies or anybody else. The world was created for me means that I have a responsibility for the world. Everything was created and then I was created. So I'm the first of creation. So our sages teach us that man is last and man is first. If you behave properly, then you are the top of creation. You dominate mineral life, vegetable life, animal life, and mankind and you connect to God. If on the other hand, you do not fulfill your mission, then we say you are the last of creation, meaning even a mosquito that takes in and does not give out has been created before you. One of the fundamental questions we need to ask ourselves is what is the difference in creation of man versus the creation of every other part of the world and the universe? When God created light, it says, when God created the birds, he created them in one shot. When he created vegetation, the same thing in multitude, in one shot. Animals, the same thing. But man, not only was he created unique by himself, but he was created in a two-step process. What was God's purpose in doing so? God first created man from the earth. And then he blew into his nostrils a breath of life. As we explained in our Tanya class many, many weeks ago, and God blew into his nostrils a breath of life. Concerning the creation, it says, and God spoke and there was. So here we see already a difference. While everything was created with speech, Man was created with speech and with breath. It says, Naase Adam, let us make man 
And then it says, and then God blew into his nostrils a breath of life. When God creates every object in the world, he creates the body and the soul, the vitality and the physical object in one word. Why? Because everyone is proportionate to the other. The soul, the vitality that's contained in a stone or in a blade of grass or in a cow is proportionate to what the body is able to handle. Here, we see that every one of the parts of creation, the levels of creation, were created with their purpose together as one. Body and soul came together. By man, there's first body and then there's soul. What does that mean, in other words? It means that the body of man was created purposeless, with no purpose. The purpose is going to be blown into man afterwards, at a second step. Why is it like this? To understand this, we have to go to the Talmud of Chagiga in the second chapter, page 16 or 17, if I'm not mistaken. Over there it says, Shisha Dvarin Bivne Adam. Man is composed of six aspects. Contains in himself six aspects. Shlosha kemal ache asharet veshlosha kebehema. The Talmud says three, in three things we resemble the angels, in three things we resemble the animals. We resemble the animals because we eat and drink, we relieve ourselves and we reproduce like animals do. On the other hand, we stand upright, we have knowledge, and we are able to speak the holy tongue, the holy language of Hebrew. And therefore, we are just like the angels in three things, and we are like the animals in three things. And therefore, man is what we call a bria tichonita, a creation which is a central creation, which is able within itself to contain heaven and earth. Now, it's interesting. There is a verse we read in last week's Torah portion, which we read in the Alenu Shabeach prayer, the concluding prayer of the service morning, afternoon, and night, where we say, you will know today, you will take to heart, that God, he is the Lord, in the heavens above, and on the earth, mitahat below. What is this concept of the heavens above and the earth below? It's not enough to say in the heavens and the earth. Well, if you look at the creation of man, you can understand this very well. When you create an animal or a blade of glass, of grass or a stone with one word, it means that right away the soul, the vitality, and the physicality of the object created, the creation, are proportionate and equal. When on the other hand, you do it in two steps, look at what happens. Man at the beginning was nothing more than dirt. It wasn't even like the dirt or the earth, which was created with its purpose in it. It was created with no purpose whatsoever. 
So the state, the original state of man's body, before God blew into his nostrils a breath of life, is purposeless. And therefore, the body of man originally was lower, not only lower than animal life, than vegetable life, but even mineral life, because it was purposeless. This is the lowest possible you can imagine, you can create. On the other hand, being that the soul came from the breath of God and not from the speech of God, which means it comes from the depth of, the, of Hashem, the intention of God, the thought of Hashem, and therefore, it comes from the highest possible spiritual levels. So while everything in creation has a certain balance and limitation, man is literally pulled in two directions, but in an extreme way, in two extreme directions. The heavens above and the earth below are contained in you and me. Now you might say, why did God do it this way? Well, obviously, this tells us a little about the purpose with which God created the world. God created the world not in order for the world to be a separate entity that is disconnected from him, but rather to be the actual mirror that is going to reflect and reveal God's presence. But where does it all start? You've heard me say it, and you will hear me say it again and again and again. Birkeder Rabbi Eliezer says, the universe is one great man, and man is a small universe, contains within himself the whole universe. King Solomon says that the whole universe is in your heart and my heart. And therefore, what is the purpose of man in this world? Is to actually put one to the service of the other. There's a famous Midrash that says, and asks the question, who is going to be judged for their actions? After 120, each one needs to go through some type of audit. How did you spend your time? Where did you spend your time? Where did you invest yourself? How much did you give of yourself in one thing over the other? It's not only in the quantity of things that you've done, but how much were you emotionally, intellectually, and physically invested in what you did? Were you more interested by the pursuit of physicality and physical pleasures and material delights? Or were you more interested by spiritual, intellectual, emotional elevation? So the moment that we are judged, the Midrash says that the soul goes and says, it wasn't me, I didn't want to do anything wrong. And the body said, what do you mean? I didn't want, I couldn't do anything if it wasn't for the soul that was giving me vitality. And the Midrash tells us a story, a very nice story of a king that had a beautiful orchard and in this orchard, he had a very special tree that would gain very special, unique fruits that were very expensive and could not be found anywhere else in the world. But he didn't know who he was going to put as a guard to protect the tree, to protect the garden. If he's going to put a normal person, that person would be automatically tempted to eat from that fruit, just like Adam and Chava were tempted to eat from the tree of knowledge. So he put there a man that was very, very short, a dwarf. 
and the dwarf was able to see with him he put a giant that was blind and like this the giant that was blind was able to protect the tree and he would know that if somebody would come right away the dwarf would tell him be careful on your right on your left up down somebody is coming protect but both the blind giant and the small seeing dwarf both of them wanted to taste of that a taste of that tree what did they do the dwarf went up on the shoulders of the giant and was able to pick a fruit and both of them were able to benefit when they finally came to judgment the giant said what do you mean i can't see it wasn't me and the dwarf said what do you mean i'm so short how can i reach this tree so the judge said i'm not going to judge you individually i'm going to put the dwarf on the shoulders of the giant and i'm going to judge you together the same thing the soul and the body before the soul comes into the body what does the mishnah say teach us in pirkei avot in the ethics of our fathers al kochach atanolat you are born against your will meaning that the soul is living an experience which is so incredible it does not want to descend in a limited body that is seduced so easily by physical and and the uh, and the material pleasures but it is forced to come down once it comes down into the body what does it say it says al kochach atanolat al kochach atakha you are born against your will you live against your will al kochach atamet against your will you die and against your will ata ata ati din taten din de khashbon ifne mela malkha amlakhim akadosh baruch hu you will give judgment before the king of all kings now comes the question how is it possible that you are born against your will and you die against your will if you're born against your will i understand the soul did not want to descend in the body but why do you die against your will the soul should be so happy to be able to disconnect from the limitations of this world and this reality the answer to this is that there is an advantage in the soul being in the body before the soul is in the body it does not have any power whatsoever it's just a flame without a wick it doesn't have where to grasp to grab there's nothing to grab over there to be able to shine your light once the soul is attached to the physical body at that moment the body itself permits the soul to elevate itself and to connect itself to godliness and to transform the world and therefore now the advantage of light over darkness is felt more than light within light which means if i light a torch a fire in the mid in midday in florida it's not going to be appreciated just like after night falls and the three stars appear and it's completely pitch dark at that moment the light is appreciated when the soul is by itself there's no real appreciation for the soul but once the soul is planted into the body at that moment there is a catalyst reaction you see just like when you put a seed in the ground there's a catalyst reaction that causes that the seed should rot and that it should grow roots and afterwards become growing to becoming 
a fruit bearing tree. And then there's an infinity of fruits which have pits which could be planted and create new trees with new fruits. It starts a process of eternity. Adam Yesodome Afar. We come from the earth. God, oh, Zahu Alat Sadiq, God plants into every single one of us, our earth, our bodies, a soul. That soul, when it comes in contact with the body, there's a catalyst reaction. And through our actions, we are able to create something new, a new reality, a higher reality, a higher purpose. We're able to bring light. So now that the soul and the body have become one, this is the moment that the soul does not want to leave the body anymore because it realizes how from the darkness you can actually reach the highest level of light. And it's interesting because in Hasidut, in Likutei Torah, in Parashat Vayet Hanan, it explains that there are different levels of godliness. There's a level of godliness which is revealed to man. And then there is a level of godliness which is so high, so elevated, that it could not be revealed. I'm going to give you an example. There are words you can say. There are motions you can make with your hands. There are expressions you can make with your face. But a thought which is deep inside your heart or your mind, is something which is above expression. And that which is above expression is something which is basically sitting in the darkness. Now there are two interpretations to darkness in Kabbalah. There is Helem, the darkness, which is negative, which is lowly, and there is the darkness, which is the highest possible level and loftiest level of holiness. The loftiest level is when something is so high, it cannot be revealed. That is the level of Keter of the crown. The crown is the level of godliness, which is so high, it could never be revealed. Well, in our hearts too, we have a part of us where God is not revealed. The heart, as we say in the Shema, Hashem in okecha, you should love the Lord your God. It does not say with one letter bet with all your heart, but it says two bets to show that the heart has two sections. There is the positive side of the heart, the good inclination, and there is the evil inclination which comes, which is on the left side of the heart. Over there, God is hidden. But God is not hidden in a way that he's so high and that's why he's hidden. He is in such a lowly place, the left ventricle of the heart which desires so much different things and lost and and could think of the lowest possible types of desires over there in that left place this is a place of darkness now what happens when a person takes the time to consciously think about the fact that in this part of his heart, he has desires which are the opposite, the polar opposite of what the soul wants. At that moment, there is a concept of what we call it, a cry of the heart. I'm so much in darkness, I'm going to cry out. Ask a mother that is troubled by her children, by her adolescent children. And you will see what a true cry of the heart is. It's deep. It's something which cannot be expressed in words. But when it comes out, it comes from the core essence of the person. 
the soul. The soul descended such a great descent from a high roof to a deep pit. Not like one, God forbid, which falls from a second or third floor. Not even like one that falls from the roof to the first floor, but one which falls from the roof all the way to a deep pit. This is the analogy, the parable that our sages give, give us when they want to express the great descent, Batered Pelaim, the great descent of the soul in the physical pit called the body. The soul now is in a distress, such an incredible distress that there is a cry out, a deep, deep cry. That deep cry from the darkest part of the being, the left side of the heart, is able to reach the most hidden part of God, the one that cannot be, cannot be revealed. Think about it for a second. The soul, which is at the highest level, fell to the lowest level. It is now in a dark place. Because it's in a dark place, there is an effect of what we call a crushing. Just like our sages teach us, the Jewish people are compared to olives. The same way the olive, when it is crushed, it takes out its best and gives olive oil that is able to create and to animate a flame. So too, a Jew, when he is crushed, when the soul feels that it fell so low, it's in such a dark place, the cry that it has is able to reach the highest possible levels. But when there's no stress, there are no challenges, everything is like they say in Hebrew, sababa, everything is cool, then there's no cry of the heart. There's a great advantage of that cry of the heart. Such a great advantage. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe said the following line, and I think it's very important we remember this all the time. All of those who struggle, we all struggle. If you're growing, you are struggling. Mm -hmm. And if you're struggling, it means that you are growing. Everybody at his level needs to know how to overcome the struggle. He says the following. You have two types of individuals which are born. You have a person which naturally has a natural inclination to do the right thing. He doesn't want to eat too much. He doesn't want to look. He's not interested in looking where he's not supposed to. He's not interested in saying bad things. He's not interested in doing bad things. He is just naturally a good person. He's good, naturally good. And then you have the individual which has sometimes desires which drive him and make him crazy. He wants to eat. He wants to look. He wants to experience. He wants to rebel. So the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe asks, who is better? Obviously the person that's good. And he says, no. The person that has a struggle he is going to have that deep cry from within. And because he has that deep cry from within, he is going to break through and transform himself and become another level of individual. He is going to change his essence. He is going to create some type of turbo energy transformation <laughs> and he will surpass 
the person that is born a naturally good, which has no ambition, no desires to change, and just lives his life as cool as it gets. It's all good. But I'm not transforming myself. Ramila Parichia says a story of a man that was going through many, many troubles. The man just went through many, many troubles. And he decided to leave his house. He left the house, went to <clears> the <throat> forest, and in the forest, he was able to find peace. No bills to think about, no responsibilities. And suddenly he heard a music. The music was so special, like a spiritual music, something that just carried him away and above all of his troubles and tribulations. He was able to imagine, to be creative again, to relive as a child, careless. And then he fell asleep. He woke up. The music was long gone. And he came back home. As he was coming closer to his house, all the troubles that seemed so far away came back to him. It was no longer yesterday, it was today. And as he's coming closer and closer, his troubles are becoming heavy, heavier and heavier. He now finds himself in front of the house, doesn't know what to do with himself. He is depressed. Everywhere he goes, he is looking for that music. And he goes into a music store and he hears some music. He's looking, he's searching, he's oh, maybe and finally, he goes to a store, and there he hears some hard rock music. And 30 seconds in the song, into a song, he hears something that resembles very much the music that he heard over there. He decides to buy the record. At the time, there used to be records, just for those of you who don't know. So he buys a record, a CD. He puts it in his car, plays, rewind, play, rewind, play, till eventually he listens to the whole song, till eventually he listens to the whole CD of music he never connected with before. But his musical taste buds get suddenly connected to this new music. He forgets why he bought the CD to start with. Rabin el says this is the story of the soul. The soul lived such a closeness with godliness, it felt what infinity feels like. It felt the highest level of wealth, the highest level of spirituality, the highest level of honor, the highest level of pleasure. And suddenly it's been ripped away to come down into a physical body with coarse desires. The soul knows what its purpose is. The body did not yet realize, it's still learning to appreciate that there's a higher purpose than just eat, drink, be merry. The soul is looking for the music. And you will see that when the soul activates itself, you will never find ever a Jew that is happy, that is satisfied with himself. I always want more. I always have a drive for more. Where is that drive coming? And that's why behind every possible institution, 
you have one which is there, even if it's negative, unfortunately, there's going to be a Jewish soul that's yearning for this connection, but a body that's not understanding the language of the soul and think the connection is going to be in drugs or into lust, God forbid, or into making more money or having more pleasures, accumulating, accumulating more wealth, and there's a drive over there to be more creative. But what is it exactly? Where does that drive come from? This drive comes from the soul. And therefore, once the soul starts connecting to its source, through Torah, through mitzvot, through Shabbat, through kosher, through, there are things which are not compatible with the soul. So when the body does it, it just the soul is in a state of distress and there's a cry from within. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily hear that cry from within. It's just like it's sunlight outside, but I'm in a home that does not have any windows. And there's a voice from heaven that calls out and says, Yaakov, Chana, Yosef, Shlomo, come back. This is not your purpose in life. Come, connect yourself to infinity. But there are no windows. So a person lives in his dark, dark home. One day, something happens. Hopefully a good thing happens. A wedding, a bris, a bas mitzvah, a birth. Or God forbid, other things happen. And there's a crack in that wall. And suddenly the ray of light of the sun, the sunlight penetrates the house. And suddenly we're able to see what we did not perceive seconds before. The moment that a Jew connects to his soul, activates the soul, one step at a time, he creates a greater crack into the wall. In order for the light of godliness that the soul identifies with to reveal itself. And when the soul identifies itself, then at that moment, the catalyst, the reaction between the soul and the body, between the seed and the ground, create new roots, stronger roots. And they sprout forth new ideas, new fruits, new directions new energy and the more you grow the more energy you are given in order to be able to transform yourself and in turn transform the world around you the soul the soul is that part of god which is the infinite god which is inside of every single one of us let's think as we are coming to the new year to the creation of man Let's understand that if God created man in two steps, it's because he gave us the best of the best to be able to invest and transform the lowest of the low. But together, when we live in peace, in harmony, with one purpose, to connect to one God, the one God, at that moment, the cry of the heart, the cry of the soul, is able to propel the body to another level. And the body with its energy and animalistic drive is able to carry the soul to new levels and new dimensions it could never attend, ascend to by itself. Hashem should bless us. And we should take, I would like to finish with an assignment. Every one of us, as we are coming to these days, closer to Rosh Hashanah, closer to the month of Elul, which is the ultimate preparation for Rosh Hashanah, to take the time every day to think about your soul. We think about our children. We think about our physical needs. Imagine if every day, for one, two, three minutes a day, we would think, what is happening with my soul? How did I feed my soul today? God bless you.
it's always a pleasure to be with you every Monday morning. And Bezat Hashem, we should go from strength to strength. And as our souls reveal themselves, the soul of the world, God Almighty, will be revealed to all of us with the coming of Mashiach and the full redemption. Amen.